Classes in Wargame Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board Wargames, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 14, Panzer Blitz, Part 1. So what we're going to do today is to discuss an example of scoping out the design of a board war game. And then we're going to advance to discuss a very different board war game. We're going to discuss the classic title, Panzerfaust. Panzerblitz, excuse me. Okay, so let us push ahead, and we are going to consider doing the game on a particular battle. And the battle is the battle of the Alamo. And there is a large amount of historic or pseudo-historic work on it. If you want to design a game that is seriously wrong, there are plenty of motion pictures on the topic. Uh, you can actually visit the site of the battlefield and see the Alamo. Uh, when I did this in 1971, I was in the Army at that time, um, you looked at all of the paintings, it was very easy to identify the two sides. The Mexicans had an orthodox European trained and uniformed army, which was in good Napoleonic uniforms. And the Texans all had halos, well, blow around the head. It was quite surprising. It wasn't at all what I expected to see. Well, maybe it should have been. In any event, let us scope things out. So the um, Texans had between 180 and 250 people. Sources vary. The Mexicans had, oh, 1,800, or maybe counting reinforcements, 2,200 men, plus, oh, 400 to 500 cavalry. The Texans had something like 19 cannon. The Mexicans had less. The people inside the fort had a substantial superiority in artillery, but they didn't have much gunpowder for the cannon, and they didn't have many cannonballs. They did, however, have artillery superiority. Uh, then we could ask, well, how big is the battlefield? And the answer is, there was a loosely speaking fortified object, and the fortified object was sort of designed to stand off attacks by Indians or whatever. And the perimeter of the fortified object was around 400 yards, meaning one can get more exact dimensions, but 150 yards long and 50 yards wide, some number like that. Um, in addition, um, if you are the Mexicans outside lining up to the attack, You might go out 200 yards in terms of representing what was going on. Oh yes, someplace over here there's a river and there are some houses. Um, you don't have to go out miles because the weapons, muskets weren't effective at those ranges and the cannon fire didn't do a great deal. So we now have a sort of approximate size of the um, situation and what is going on. Now let us take these numbers which describe the reality and say, we are going to attempt to turn this into a game. So we would like, oh, let's be, let's be somewhat restrictive and say, we would like about 50 or 100 unit counters on each side. Not a thousand, God forbid. <coughs> 50 or 100 unit counters on each side. So for the Texans, at 50 unit counters, you might say that each unit counter represents about five men. Uh, however, on one hand, there are a number of famous people there who uh, the people who are playing this would like to see the individual counter for Davy Crockett, etc., etc., etc. And so there will be a few at one per counter. Also, there were artillery crews of known size, three to four per counter. And in order to make this work, maybe most of those other groups of people are around a half dozen. For the Mexicans, 
if you say you only want um, you want under a hundred counters um, and maybe you would like significantly less like 60 counters um, something for the Mexicans we have just established that something like 50 men per counter is about right some number like that maybe a moderately smaller um, the Mexicans chose to attack in column. That is, you have some number of guys in a row, and more behind it, and more behind that, and more behind that, and more behind that. Uh, part of that was that a substantial part of the, their force was, was seriously un, under-trained, uh, so there were significant casualties where uh, people saw Texans and shot at them and didn't realize that if you're a distance back in the column and fire your weapon level, you will shoot a man in front of you, not a Texan, as you were attempting to do. Um, however, you still need some number of counters, and something like this, maybe you would like um, fewer men per counter, and you will have reserve rules where all of the forces weren't on the board, uh, for example, the horse cavalry was, is not going to be effective until you open a gate, a large gate in the wall, that was done. And the cavalry can charge through, that was done. At which point the people, in, the Texans inside who are not in, in a serious building are in very serious trouble. They died. What one can also ask, this is what happens when you consult historical sources, what sorts of things are going on? Well, first of all, it's a fortress. It's not a very good fortress, but it is a fortified position. And you have to ask, in period, how do you attack fortified positions? And there are really three choices. And one is um, starvation. That is, you just surround the place, no one goes in or out. And because no one goes in or out, eventually the people inside run out of food and water. The problem with this is that the Mexican army had made a strategic decision. They had two choices. And one choice was to march along the sea coast where the Mexican navy could have re resupplied them and brought them reinforcements. And there was the choice they took, which was to march into the center of the states, more or less, towards Bexar. And because they did that, they were very ser seriously short on supply. They also had the issue that there were large numbers of um, wives, children, camp followers, etc., etc., marching along, and they were eating up supply too. And so the question is, if we try starvation, who runs out of food first? Uh, Santa Ana, who had professional military training, looked at the thing, the, the Alamo, and was seriously not impressed with it as a fortress. He had, however, two choices. And one choice were formal siege methods, as developed, for example, by the French general Val Marshal, I should say, Vauban. And the other choice was to storm. Let's do a sketch on siege tactics. The notion of siege tactics is that you have people hiding behind this big, heavy wall and they have cannon just as you do. And what you would like to do is to arrange things so that you can blow holes in the wall, which mostly means firing cannonballs at it until it collapses. And you would like to do this so that the enemy cannon doesn't destroy, don't destroy you first. So here is the hypothetical fortress. And the first thing you do is you put up two lines. And these are earth berms and trenches on the correct side of them. And these are called lines of circumvallation. And the point of the inner one is to keep the enemy from getting out and escaping and to protect your people who are looking towards the enemy formation position from getting too badly injured when shot at. The point of the other one is that all of the time you are conducting a siege, 
it is typically the case that the opposition force will have other forces outside who would like to try to show up and attack you from what would be your rear. So you need a double line. The most famous battle that double walls around a central point uh, would be the battle that Caesar fought the siege of Alasia, which is in France, in which he had two lines like this, which each of which were a considerable number of miles long, meaning you need a lot of people to man it. Having set this up in the period where we have gunpowder weapons, what you then do is you start running trenches towards the enemy to get positions that are closer and closer, but you have a little problem. If you just dig the trench straight this way, the enemy will park a cannon here where they can shoot straight down your trench with negative effects on anyone in the trench. So what your trenches have to do is zig and zag back and forth, and at some point when you get to about historical period distance, something like 300 yards, you have a set of positions in which you can sort of mount a cannon, and you then start running in additional lines closer and closer, and when you get to about, oh, 50 or 100 yards out, depending on what the opposition has to shoot at you, you are now close enough that your siege cannon can be emplaced and fired at the enemy positions and, do, and have some reasonable chance of doing damage. Uh, the main problem is, period cannon, we are just moving, if we are at the Alamo, out of the period where this was an issue, did not aim very much. And so, you know, if I have a cannon here, the cannonballs strike a considerable part of the wall, or berm, or whatever is there, and you have to score a lot of hits on the same thing to wreck it. Um, to do, so you do this, and then you put in positions fairly close, like 50, or this may be 150 yards, this is more like 100 or 50 yards, and you then have mortars, cannon, ground, cannonball goes way up and comes down again, and the mortars would go over the wall and drop someplace inside, and, since, and the, the walls would offer no protection. Eventually, when you've knocked a hole, and there are probably several walls, or all sorts of interesting, funny named things, and in the end, when you have knocked a hole in the wall, you could then invite the enemy to surrender, and if the enemy surrendered, they surrendered, and if they didn't, you had to storm the place, and the trad European tradition was, if you had to storm a place, you were going to kill everyone, most of the people inside, you were going to loot the place completely, and all sorts of other unpleasant things. That's a, those are siege tactics. The third choice, though, was the choice that Santa Ana followed. And the choice that Santa Ana followed was based on the notion, here is the ground, here is a typical piece of wall, which might be 10 feet tall. Um, and the walls were not thin. The walls were several feet thick. So Santa Ana the commander of the Mexican forces who was besieging the place had the technical difficulty that his cannon would have great difficulty knocking holes in the wall if he could do it at all. So what the Texans had done behind this wall, which was more decorative, was to put up a scaffolding so that someone here could shoot over the wall, though since there were no slits in the wall, you had to have at least head and shoulders above the wall to shoot, which was fairly dangerous. The approach to storming, here is our storming column, is you have a bunch of people running this way, and they're carrying ladders, and you put the ladders up on the wall, and you climb up the wall, and the people at the top try to keep you from climbing. But if you're lucky, there are a lot of you at this point in the wall, and a lot of ladders, and not many people on the other side. In addition, this was brick. It had lots of um, hand holes, and there was a Mexican general who was leading his column who noted this and climbed the wall using the hand holes and got to the top. And once he'd reached the top, 
Uh, first of all, he'd now established an area where there were not Texans, and therefore the ladders wouldn't be knocked down. And second, there were lots of these guys following who follow the leader, it really works, were willing to do the same thing. Um, so that's storming, that's what the um, tactic that Santa Ana did. So what sort of combat do we need? Well, we need to do something to represent cannon fire. And we need something to represent musketry. Most of the combat inside was not done with muskets. Uh, the Mexican army had good rifles with ba or good muskets anyhow with bayonets, spears, and that is in fact what most of the combat was in involved in once the walls were crossed. Uh, finally. The Mexican cavalry, once one of the larger gates was open, did get inside, and th that combat was largely saber, that is, sword. Um, saber and lance continued to be um, how cavalry fought. Well, in the United States until the Civil War, when it was noticed that the point of horse cavalry was to have people run up, ride up fast with rifles and take cover, and someone hit the horses. Uh, the Europeans didn't figure this out until World War I. So we have a bunch of types of combat, and at some point you have to ask, well, how big is the board going to be? Um, if you have a group of 50 people, they might be 10 by 5, something like that. And you stack people like this to make an assault column. Uh, Ten people wide is going to be about 30 feet. Ten yards. Something like that. You can get tighter packing with very well-trained troops, but well-trained troops won't do this because they realize they want to be spread out more to reduce the effectiveness of enemy artillery. So you have something that's going to be about 10 yards wide, and if you say the um, Alamo is 150 yards, is 150 by 50, very vague numbers. For, for starters, it's not a rectangle, really. If you say a single square covers 10 yards, this is about 15 squares by 5. If you say the formation is shown as a, two, a double wide formation, that is, Here are two hexes, and here is the unit counter. In that case, the Alamo becomes something like 30 by 10, which is already somewhat small since there are buildings inside. And you could make it still larger, at which point you reasonably would say that the unit counter is, say, three squares wide. And now you've sort of established a scale, because after all, this thing is 150 by 50 yards. And if it's 150 by 50 yards, how many squares wide do you want the thing to be? Well, you certainly don't want it to be 150 squares wide. That would be a very large object if you consider the Stalingrad board. You certainly don't want it, say, 5 by 2, because then the, you could, there's no terrain inside, it's just a little blob. So you, you choose the um, size of the map so it's convenient relative to what you want to do. Maybe you um, idealize out here so you don't go too far outside the walls, but you say there are set-up positions, and while the Mexican army is in its set-up position, it can be shot at by the opposition. And so we now, you now have to set up some guesses to effectiveness of musketry, low. Effectiveness of close combat, quite lethal. Um, effectiveness of cannon, limited, because, mostly because there were the, well, the Mexicans didn't fire artillery during the attack. They'd have hit their own people. The Texans didn't have much in the way of ammunition and did not have time to reload because they were not professional artillerists for the most part. Um, so you sort of estimate what all of these things are, and then you play it out. 
And you can look up in the history, the Mexicans launched a certain number of assault columns. They, to a certain extent, had forces on the other side which showed up late. And as most of the Texans had gone to defend against the attack, those people were able to get over the wall quite painlessly. So, what should the outcome be of all this? The historical outcome is that the Texan forces were entirely wiped out. So the Texans lost, oh, 180 or 250. There's some historical issue. People, not counting some non-combatants who were captured. Uh, the um, Mexicans lost, the usual number is 600, but that's killed and wounded. And of the uh, wound killed, there were about 60 immediately, and a reasonable guess is that maybe another 150 were killed. So perhaps the Mexican losses dead were smaller than the Texan losses. They certainly weren't vastly larger. Um, and you play the game and you ask, well, what happens? And if the Mexicans keep losing, you've made, you have to fix the rules. And if the Mexicans charge in and take no losses, you have to fix the rules. So I've now described scoping out. That is, you know roughly how big the forces are. You know what the battlefield is. In fact, you can go there and put a tape measure down if you're curious about a number of things. Um, you have some idea of what combat looked like. And I've now described scoping out. This is sort of what um, Jim Donegan calls concept development. So I've now shown you roughly, roughly what you are going to be doing uh, when you set up a board game. And as we are in the second half of the course, at some point fairly soon, a discussion of, well, you don't have to take my suggestions, though I thought they were reasonable, and roughly how many unit counters and how big the map is and what other issues you're going to do. And I gave you several suggestions on how to do things. I have also now given you two sets of rules, namely I have reprinted fair use, the Stalingrad rules, so you can read those. And if you look in the rear of my book, you will find the rules to Fall of Manchukuo, a completely different game using sort of the same rule system, but not quite. Okay, so we have now discussed what we are going to do, and now we are going to advance tens of lists. Panzer Blitz and its sequels are World War II combat games. The core issue is they are on a much finer scale. The units are much smaller, the, the squares are much smaller, the times scale is mu much smaller. So a single square, it's fought between countries that use the metric system, is 250 meters, one turn equals six minutes. And here is a unit counter. And a unit counter might represent a platoon which might typically be 30 or 40 men, or it might represent a few vehicles. How many vehicles depends on what the vehicle is. Um, there are also trucks and wagons running around. The game scale is much smaller. The game scale, however, is small enough that it actually sort of represent, looks like combat in the sense you have a unit counter here and many hex squares away there is another unit counter here and this unit counter chooses to shoot at that particular unit counter. So you actually see firing and combat taking place. Now you can go to much smaller scales than this. Uh, you can go to games in which, gee, a single unit counter represents a single person. Um, an interesting example of this is technically not a board game, but it's played on hexagons. There is a superhero game, Champions, 
and a square is O oh, two meters across, which is actually fairly big. Several people can stand in it fairly straightforwardly. Uh, the basic time unit, if I recall correctly, I may give it to modern D and D instead, is something like six seconds. So there are lots. The time scale is very short. Um, gee, individual. This is sort of a platoon scale. When Panzerblitz came out, it was very radical. It was so radical that the rules of the game start out by telling players, forget everything you think you know about board war games and read the rules carefully because it's completely different. Which it was. It wasn't absolutely completely different. Uh, the first game on this scale was not Panzer Blitz. It was almost certainly the Panzerfaust magazine <coughs> game, Company Commanders, which is on a slightly smaller scale, squads and individual vehicles. Uh, the game, this game was originally was de designed by Jim Donegan, and he actually had done a sort of test version of the game under the name Tactical Game Three. Tactical Game Three was a real game. It was a game that tested the ideas that turned into Panzerblitz. It's a test in the sense, well, if you go to New York City, there is Central Park, and famous architect designed it, and you see all these wonderful things. On the other hand, if you walk over there to Elm Park, it's another Olmsted Park, it's the same park on a much smaller scale. Those are his sketch over two blocks from here are his sketch notes for what became New York City Central Park. <coughs> so we have a small scale game, and because it's a small scale game, considerations of what is going on are very different than they are in a game in which turns take represent a month of time and units represent tens of thousands of men and thousands of vehicles. Now, if you're designing something like this from scratch, one of the sensible things you ask is, well, is there anything like this anywhere else I can look at? And one of the answers is to go look at people who fight battles with toy soldiers, miniatures. And there were indeed miniatures rules for small engagements where each figurine stands for a few people, or if you talk about skirmish games, each figure stands for one person. But for board games, this was very radical. Well, having said it was very radical, there were a whole bunch of general things that were introduced by Dunnigan that are not simply, we have to write rules so it looks like reality. Or at least, it has the flavor of reality. That's not the same as simulating reality. I will at some point give a series of comments on the notion that simulation is impossible. And maybe I'll do that at the end of this discussion. So we will start out, and what sort of things were inserted that were new? Well, one thing that was inserted was the scenario. That is, we have a Panzerblitz unit. Here's a Panzerblitz unit. And it has a symbol on it, and it has a bunch of numbers on it, which we'll discuss later. And it has, an, uh, and it has something that's labeled, for example, 20 millimeter, which tells you which type of infantry gun it is. And down at the bottom, though, is some number like, well, I'm making this one up, 1307. Those unit counter numbers are not real numbers. The numbers that you saw on a 1914 unit counter or a Stalingrad unit counter are the actual unit numbers of the units that were engaged in the war in question. So there actually was at some point a Soviet 28th Infantry Corps. There actually was a German 56th Armored Corps. 
Uh, the translation core from the Soviet, there's some interesting imprecision there which we can skip over. Here, they're just arbitrary numbers so you can tell which unit counter is which. And then with the game, we're a stack of about a dozen different engagements fought using units of this size at different points in the war. Uh, the it, engagements would involve 15 to 50 unit counters on each side. And you were told to use so many of these And that is a truck, and it has a different set of labels on it. And you were told how many of each of these things to use, but the same units fought in many different battles. And therefore, you got cards, and you could use the same unit counters to represent many different engagements on the scale on which the game was designed. Uh, why is that an important advantage? Well, suppose I sell a war board war game like... 1914. You play the game, and it may very well be the case, the designer hopes it isn't, that after the players have played it a few times, the scope of the game is exhausted. It's clear that one side or the other has an enormous advantage once they've figured out how the rules work. So you play the game a couple times, and mm, the interest is exhausted. It's like watching um, a, a television show um, with rare exceptions, why would you want to watch the same episode of the same television show five times? Um, other than a love of being tortured. Uh, well, in any event, the notion of the scenario is, I don't have to produce a new game to keep sales up. I simply print a new set of scenario cards. You have another dozen scenarios to fight, and you can use the same counters. Furthermore, I will sell, separate from selling the um, counters and map and rules in a box, you can mail order from Avalon Hill extra unit counters of different types so you can fight additional battles. And so I have the box, and the box lets you do lots of different things. It's like having a computer that can run more than one program as opposed to a computer in which the program is hardwired into the computer and this is the computer that will only do word processing. And if you want to do a spreadsheet, you have to buy a second spread computer with the spreadsheet built in. I am not making this up. Someone tried to sell it. Um, and you notice it gives you much more variety. Furthermore, Avalon Hill took the perspective that if other people started designing scenarios or different counters or represented other armies that were not seen in this one, this, re this game re represents only the Russian and German army, but if someone wants to show up with a whole stack of American units, that's good because it keeps interest up in the game. That is the opposite of the approach that was done, taken by tactical studies rules for trying to market D&D. So Panzerblitz has all of these features as the scenario. In addition, there was the wonderful creation, the geomorphic map board. The map board came in pieces. Now, they could have been a little more original than they were. The uh, Panzerblitz map boards were long rectangles. They could have been squares. Um, at least some of you will have played Carcassonne or some other tile-laying game. And you see squares. And the point of the geomorphic map board is that if you design them carefully, you can put them down next to each other, end to end or side to side, and everything fits. Now that requires, for example, you, I'm, I'm just going to make something up. You have two roads coming off the end, and they're the same distance from each edge. So if I stick another map board here, whether it's map A or map B or map C, guess what? The roads match. And if there is a river heading off here, there will be a matching river here. There's a matching river here. Um, and if I turn this upside down, 
here's another A, here's the river. B must have another river here, meaning here. And so you bring things together, and no matter how you bring things together, it works. This is not quite the same as Carcassonne, in which some tiles fit and some don't. This was designed so all possible board arrangements actually work. And that means you can sell lots of map boards, because there are people who will want to take the game, and instead of fighting, oh, battalion versus battalion, that's roughly what you were looking at, you can fight division versus division on a huge map. Of course, if you try that, you discover there's some problems. And the problems are covered by the technical phrase, design for effect. And Jim Dunning is very honest about this. You can avoid design by, for effect by putting in detailed rules that handle things. The problem with this is that after you have done this, instead of having a rule book that is, oh, not more than twice as large as the Stalingrad rule book, you have a 70-page book of rules with such things, and you have all of the counters for keeping track of the ammunition supply of every single unit on the board. And this is a really cool game if you're turned on by accounting. There are people who are like this, and there are games for them. So what Jim said was that each turn is about six minutes. Check. Each turn is about six minutes. The games run 10 or maybe 12 or 14 turns, an hour or an hour and a half. During an hour or an hour and a half, a unit will be firing away using its weapons part of the time, but not all of the time. And during that time, it will go through most of its combat load of ammunition. It won't go through more than its combat load. It won't not need to resupply. But it will go through roughly the ammunition it has. And that's about what a unit would do in a day. Because after you, a battalion has done one of these things, uh, you have to reorganize, you have to resupply, you have to do all of these things. There was also the issue of combat results. We'll discuss this in some detail. But the notion was disperse, double disperse, and eliminate, which is not an actual, it got wiped out. And the notion of disperse and double disperse and eliminate, the combat result is a unit is dispersed. It doesn't move. It doesn't shoot. It just sits there. And it will sit there for about a turn. And what has happened is you had some casualties. You were hit by artillery, and people have taken cover and have to be persuaded to stand up again, which is not trivial if you're talking about real human beings who've had artillery shells landing on them. And it takes a while. Eliminate on this time scale does not mean you killed everyone. What it means is, for example, you killed or seriously wounded the commanding officer and the senior uh, sergeant or two, and now the unit is so sufficiently disorganized that it has to get things together, find out, put whoever it is in charge, put the correct NCOs in the right place. If there are other casualties, they have to be evacuated and all these other good things. And it takes the unit a while to get going again, long enough that the game is over if it's an hour game. If you decide you're going to run an engagement between two, two division, army divisions that will take a day, well, eliminate does not mean eliminate. It will seem superficially that the casualties are enormous relative to the real world, but that's because the design for effect on combat odds has not done what it was supposed to. So we have sort of discussed the um, major innovations. There are rules innovations. For example, there is a line of sight rule. The basic notion is I am here, the other guy is here, and in order to be able to shoot at him, either I have to see where he is and aim, 
or I have to do what is known as, if I'm artillery, indirect fire, where someone here tells me where to shoot, and I then shoot there. Um, in order to handle line of sight, you need to do something to represent the terrain. Now, there are various ways of doing this. One is to say, we're fighting on an airstrip. Everything is completely flat. There are no zone uh, line of sight problems. At the other end, you could say, we will have 3D terrain, and we will have 3D combat units. And to tell whether there's line of sight or not, we will have little periscopes so the uh, players can stand above the board, look down, and look to see if they see the enemy. And this was the game, Battle of Kalnock, which you do not recognize because it's a science fiction game, giant robots on another planet. But people have actually done that at the other extreme. Okay, so I've said there are going to be extra rules. What I am going to do for the last five minutes or so is to discuss the notion that simulation is impossible. And the question is, why would I claim that you can't really design simulation? That is, you can't design something that is really completely realistic and historically accurate. And the first reason you can't may be described either as surprise or as things that only work because the other side did not know about them in advance. And a good example of this, we return to the Battle of Zama, which was the Romans before the city of Carthage. And the Carthaginians had elephants, which are large, these are African elephants, mean-tempered, not persuaded to be slow down because someone is jabbing them with a Roman short sword. Short sword. That just makes them angry. And you're the Roman commander, and the question is, what solution do you find for this issue? And the answer, at least once, which is all he needed, was the flaming pig. That is, he co took a collection herd of swine, he swaddled them very heavily in linen cloth, he soaked the linen cloth in olive oil, lamp oil, and then at the key moment, he ignited the pigs and had the soldiers jab them with spears and make all sorts of noise, and the pigs took off in the direction of the enemy, shrieking like swine in torment, which of course they were. Uh, elephants take very poorly to having balls of fire run at them, and the elephants panicked and stampeded away through a major Carthaginian formation, thus effectively winning the battle. Second example, this goes back roughly to the time of the Battle of Sekigahara. And we have a tower of some significant height. And it has a spiral staircase leading up. And the staircase is arranged so that the folks leading up, these, if I call this correctly, Japanese Fancy sword in the right hand, weak sword in the left hand. These were not shield carrying. And so we are going up like this with the sword arm against the wall. And the problem is that someone's grandmother is at the top of the tower. And the order has been, well, <clears throat> we have to take her down. Unfortunately, this is Jap Japanese in period women, or at least some of them were trained in combat. Samori, it's, it's feminine form. And Granny had a chain flail. 27 dead samurai later, they worked out that walking up the staircase or running against Grandmother was not going to do. So they filled the base of the tower with straw soaked in oil. This is what is called improvisation. And they set it on fire. And being a good Japanese warrior, she committed suicide by jumping into the tower as opposed to out onto the ground where she might have been captured. Uh, go ahead, write a combat rule that represents this in a reasonable and plausible way. Um, there are a couple of other issues, one of which is called finding facts. For example, the emperor, Persian emperor Xerxes in, invaded Greece. And perhaps he had an army of 15,000 men. 
and perhaps he had 50,000 men, and perhaps if you had, he had 150,000 men. The period sources are a little more enthusiastic, and at some point in here, there's some questions on how he could possibly have handled logistics. But the facts are very hard to get. <clears throat> now you might say, okay, we'll do modern warfare, we'll do World War II. Anyone who wants to do this must, absolutely must read one book, Liddell Hart and the Weight of History. The main theme of which is that much historical information of the interpretive sort, not the number of tanks in this division on that day sort, but the interpretive sort was a historical fraud. It was a historical fraud by one man who wrote very fast and had the right connections. And so, for example, you will find the claim that tank warfare was developed in England and then the Germans walked off with it. And this, you can point at a sentence in the introduction to Guderian's, this is a German general book, where he says this. Well, there's one problem. That sentence is only in the English edition. The German original does not have the sentence. And the English sentence was, invent, was inserted by one of the people to whom Guderian is giving credit for having developed tank warfare. Uh, it is truly astonishing how many issues of this sort crop up. Now, last point on why simulation is impossible is it's very nice to say, well, we will do technology. I'm going to run very slightly over. We will do technology, and the technology does all sorts of neat things for us. Uh, point one, having technology does not mean you can get it to work. The Union Army, Civil War, had balloon reconnaissance. They didn't have the doctrine to make it work, and therefore the Union Army's balloon reconnaissance eh, was not very useful. Let us advance a piece, the first battleships. If you look at late 19th century battleships, they were all equipped with ram bows, so you could use your battleship to ram the enemy battleship and sink him. Uh, this did not work very well. Why did anyone think that ram bows worked? And the answer is the Battle of Lissa. First European battleship battle. And several battleships were sunk by ramming by enemy ships, and people thought this was a working technique. Uh, there were also people who stuck torpedo tubes into period battleships pointing sideways. Um, that didn't turn out to work too well. That was used once in, in two world wars. Uh, there were people who had ingenious ideas about, oh, well, aircraft carriers and what we can do with them. Those did work. Um, there was, the, on the other hand, the world's first military hovercraft. Does anyone want to guess which navy deployed it? Austro-Hungarian, World War I. It worked. The steering wasn't very good. The payload reached the limit. They hadn't invented what are called skirts that you need to put on hovercraft to reduce the amount of power you need to pump up the air under the vessel. But other than that, it actually was deployed. Um, oh yes, World War II. The Japanese, the Americans had the atomic bomb. That was iffy until we determined they did go off. The Japanese at one point were working on the radar ray. The radar ray was sort of like a microwave oven in the sky. You fired microwaves at the enemy bombers and slagged them down. Um, eventually someone worked out the power requirements. It can't be done, but it would have been very impressive. The Japanese did, however, go much, very much into the notion of, well, the point of the ship is to carry as many guns as possible, so we'll just keep loading things on the top deck. They kept doing this until one of their light cruisers capsized from the excess weight. Uh, could you put that into a simulation? Yes. Would any player make that mistake if he knew about the rules? No. So I've now given you an impression of why simulation does not work.
and next time we will advance to a discussion of the Panzer Blitz rules.